Okay, um, because of some unforeseen circumstances, uh, this is going to be a follow-up lecture for Friday. I'll post it later today. This is Thursday. But um, I did a lecture on the first millennium, and uh, I included some music in it, which uh, YouTube rejected. Um, not surprising, I suppose. I had forgotten about that. So um, I will play the music in class, and uh, you can't really upload these things because they're copyrighted. Um, <clears throat> but I can play the music in class for you because I do subscribe to YouTube Music, and that's where I played it from, but uh, not allowed to broadcast it on YouTube. So uh, this lecture is going to sort of follow up on the material that we, we talk about tomorrow, so there's no rush for you to watch this until we have Friday's lecture. Um, this is a, a second week, the second week of our discussion about uh, British culture. Uh, we've already talked about Boudicca. Um, <clears throat> I'll just remind you that the people that occupied the British Isles uh, before the Roman conquest were um, the people that the Romans called the Britons. And there was many different tribes. Uh, Boudicca was the queen of one of those tribes and because of um, the way that the Romans treated her family, especially after her, fu her, her husband's death, um, she led a rebellion, <clears throat> which did a lot of damage, but ultimately was put down by the Romans. Um, the Romans stayed from about 43 AD, they invaded, um, and they stayed for the next 350 years. So when you occupy an area that long, uh, the dominant culture became Roman. Um, it's been said many times that when you go to England, many of the roads that are still in use today in, in the countryside and London itself, the basic um, outline of London, the, the city itself, London is a metropolitan city that's many, many times larger than it used to be. But Londinium was the Roman city and, and the, the sort of outline of that, that uh, city from ancient times uh, still exists. You can come out of the subway stations and see pieces of the Roman wall. <clears throat> some of them are buried beneath the current city, but some of them are kind of poking up, like the bones of an old <clears throat> uh, prehistoric, you know, creature, like a dinosaur. Um, <clears throat> when you drive in England, which I've never done, the, the roads are the same roads that the Romans used. Um, England, one of the fundamental things about England is that it has a lot of rivers and they mostly travel from um, west to east and um, which is <clears throat> going to um, cause the rivers to flow out into the North Sea, not towards the Atlantic, but the other way. Um, for much of English history and British history as a, as a whole, um, England has been oriented towards Europe. and sometimes towards Sweden or Denmark, sometimes towards France or Germany, and sometimes towards Spain. With the focus of England geographically, it's sort of a natural connection because the fastest way to move things until we started inventing trains and airplanes was by rivers. So most people think about England as, and the British Isles themselves, as sort of like a island fortress but as I will demonstrate uh, tomorrow, and by talking about these leaders of these people, um, there's a reason that the English and the British states <clears throat> were pretty worried about invasion because uh, waterways were not just good for transportation of, and for trade, but they were also meant that other countries could move their armies uh, quickly um, to attack at any point. So the only way that they could defend themselves was to develop this uh, British Navy, but that will come much later. In the first thousand years of the British Isles, they don't really have a way to protect people from landing. Julius Caesar didn't have any trouble crossing the English Channel, um, which is about 20 miles or, or 30 some odd kilometers. 
um, wide, people have, have actually, um, that swimmers have gone across this, human beings have, have uh, swum the channel. And um, that's, that's how close it is. You can actually see on a clear day uh, from France, um, Calais is the famous last part of France that, is, uh, that belongs to the British. And if you stand in France, you can see the white cliffs of Dover in the distance. Again, I haven't personally done that. That's just what I've been told. So it's not a very wide gap. It's nothing like, um, you know, from Busan to Japan, um, from the Korean Peninsula to Japan is about 200 kilometers. So that's about 10 times uh, farther. And the, the, the Koreans, um, as you know, Lee Sun Shin and the Korean Navy uh, were unable to stop the Japanese army from landing. Had they been prepared and intercepted uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi's fleet, then Imjin, the Imjin War would have a totally different result. Uh, that's what the British would later do, but in the first thousand years, other cultures had superior uh, navies and better shipping um, industries, and uh, they would take advantage of that, and it would be pretty much impossible for them to stop, for example, the Vikings from landing uh, in English territory and Scotland and Ireland as well. Pretty much vulnerable. If you were near a river, a large river, a Viking ship could just come up the river and attack you. We'll talk about the, the people and the cultures later, but um, a representative figure, which unfortunately I haven't detailed in this book, which it's a major oversight for the fourth edition, but I do have a PowerPoint presentation for the class, which I will show you what um, pictures of King Arthur used to look like. Uh, he's he's a, one of the most famous kings in English history, uh, but he's not English. Uh, he's he's a, a Celtic person of blood who is sort of supposedly um, fought against the Anglo-Saxons, which the Anglo-Saxons were the ones who sort of unified England into a, a cohesive kingdom eventually, um, hundreds of years later. But around the time that the, the Romans left, in the early 400s, somewhere in the fifth century, the, the Romans left, right? And I don't really have any good examples of Roman leaders who fit into British culture. Um, Julius Caesar is the most famous person who visited the islands and Emperor Claudius uh, is the one who invaded them about a hundred years later. But uh, no Romans really figure largely in British culture. Um, individual Romans are not part of the sort of ancestry of the British, but King Arthur is representative of both the sort of Roman tradition because he's, he became Christianized later. Um, but the original person, whoever he was, was supposedly uh, of Celtic you know, heritage. Ethnically, he was a Briton, um, and he was Christian, and uh, he fought against uh, the invasion of, of a pagan German um, group of conquerors, Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. We'll talk about this again tomorrow. So he actually, though he was adopted by British culture, especially by Anglo-Norman culture, hundreds of years later, uh, he was probably not um, related to any of those people. He was, he was probably a, a Celtic person um, by blood, and he was probably some sort of war chieftain, some sort of warlord, and temporarily stopped this um, sort of cultural dominance of the, the Angles and the Saxons when they invaded from Germany. So um, that's why <clears throat> we have this word Anglo-Saxon now. Uh, the Jutes are a, a third group that they, they ended up sort of landing close to um, the continent in the, the area that the region is, it was a kingdom called Kent. Uh, eventually, though Kent still exists, and that's the, the part of England that's southeast of London, which is right next to um, France, the closest part of the, the islands, the most vulnerable part, the, the part that's most influenced by continental um, culture because of its proximity 
And um, the part of England that often uh, has a, a revolt and, and um, protests against war against the continent because they're the ones that were going to be attacked first, whether it's William the Conqueror or it's Napoleon or it's the Spanish Armada, all these groups, um, they're gonna land probably in the southeast of London in your backyard if you're from the kingdom of Kent. So the Jutes kind of get the, the short, sh uh, short shift um, because of that. Um, King Arthur himself, the legends are written mostly as in a sort of romance about King Arthur. Uh, Sir Lancelot is added later and the Knights of the Round Table, all the stuff that you may know about the sword being pulled from the stone and Merlin, the wizard who finds this sword from the Lady of the Lake. Um, all these legends uh, are all created hundreds and hundreds of years later, around 1100 AD. and. Uh, We'll talk about an English king named Richard the Lionheart, who sort of adopts the persona of uh, King Arthur. He comes the closest to being a real life King Arthur, but uh, we don't really have any archeological or historical evidence. One of the distinctive features about the Celts, um, we've talked about their, they had tattoos. Sometimes they carried uh, heads to intimidate people. They had long hair, um, often they, they fought with very little clothing on, not that much armor, just to demonstrate their individual strength and power. A Romano Briton would not do that. Um, they sort of transform into knights. Um, that's not possible. They would have had sort of maybe a Roman style armor, which is sort of uh, greaves to cover your legs and uh, some sort of breastplate and a shield and a spear and a, a gladius sword. That's the Roman sort of basic military kit. And uh, that's the sort of thing that Arthur would have worn too. Nobody is, you know, running around in 400, 500 AD with these gigantic war horses um, covered in plate armor. That doesn't really happen until a thousand years later. But when these stories are told um, and other kings try to imitate the, you know, the, the courtly splendor of, of Camelot, which is the sort of imaginary capital of King Arthur's court, the court at Camelot. When they try to imagine themselves being uh, like King Arthur, um, they are wearing, they're, they're doing knights. They, they, have, they have long lances and they have swords and they have heavy plate armor. Some of them even have to be sort of lifted onto their horses in order to fight. That's not the style of fighting that the, the Romans did or the Celts. Um, their armor was much more light. light their armor was light and uh, there were horses. Um, they were sometimes drawing chariots or sometimes carrying them into battle. But the majority of the fighters were, of course, on foot. And sometimes uh, later, um, the invaders would have horses, not the Vikings, but the Normans would have horses. And that's when the age of, of knights begins. But uh, King Arthur is often portrayed as a knight and he has knights at the round table. So this is all sort of historically um, anachronistic. It doesn't belong in the period of King Arthur. So he becomes very symbolic of, of British culture and he combines all the people eventually all of these people, the, the Germanic people, the Celtic people, the Roman people, they will all be sort of combined to create sort of a, a British, you know, race is what they've tried to do. Is, and, and he did not belong to any of those other groups. They, he's not a, related uh, by blood to any of these people, most likely, but he's, he's sort of a cultural mishmash of all those people, which, the Normans were very interested in sort of gathering all the people that inhabited, all the different types of people, and unifying them under one symbolic uh, type of person. And that person, you could say, King Arthur is one of them. Alfred the Great is another candidate. Um, we'll talk about him now. He's, he comes along um, hundreds of years after the initial invasions by the Angles and the Saxons. He he is the, the, ends up being the king 
of one of the seven kingdoms of England. And one by one, these kingdoms end up falling while he is king of Wessex. Uh, his, his older brother and his father are, are the king of Wessex. All, all of the kingdoms, one by one, get invaded and sort of collapse under the pressure of the Vikings. And Wessex is the last one remaining. Um, Alfred had two older brothers, so it was not likely that he was going to be the king. He also had some health problems, digestive problems, and he had epilepsy, so he would suddenly sort of um, fall down and, and convulse, and there was no real treatment for that kind of illness. Uh, and he also had maybe some sort of irritation in his stomach, so he was often needed to uh, go to the bathroom. This is These are realities that uh, were part of his life, so he was not a healthy uh, kid as a, as a young person. And he had two older brothers, so he wasn't expected to become the king. He ended up uh, going to Rome on a pilgrimage, and this is a very famous thing because he meets the Pope, and the Pope sort of uh, blesses him, and this is a, a moment that, you know, his destiny... Um, becomes realized. So in retrospect, it's e easy to say. He traveled hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, it's several thousand kilometers. It, it would be like traveling to the moon almost now. That's the kind of journey that he undertook as a, as a young person, as a teenager. I think he was not even in his teens yet when he uh, traveled to Rome. And the Pope blesses him, and then he returns, and um, his older brother dies first, and then uh, his other older brother, Ethelred, becomes king, and then he also dies. So the, the crown passes to him, which gives him the opportunity um, to display his talent for everything. He's called Alfred the Great. Um, I like to compare him to Sejong because he's sort of, he, he, he um, was multi-talented, like Sejong was. He was militarily gifted, he was uh, encouraged culture and art and um, developed, he tried to improve the, the shipbuilding technology and to build a fleet, although that wasn't very successful. Um, he repelled, successfully repelled the Vikings by fighting and sometimes by paying them to leave Wessex alone. Um, Southern England, he, he gradually started retaking parts of southern England, and his son and his grandson will complete the process of taking all of the kingdoms back and unifying all of England under one Anglo-Saxon king. So before Alfred, there is seven kingdoms, so seven kings of England, and they all collapse except for him, and he's surrounded by Vikings and, and ruined kingdoms, and he manages to stop the Vikings and turn the tide and retake it so that a hundred years later, uh, we're calling uh, this place Angoland, the place of the Angles, right? Down here you'll see um, Angoland is the original, the land of the Angles is where we get the name England from. And King Arthur's Romano-Britain, the, the province of Britannia was the Roman province of Britannia, that's what they called it. And that's where we get the name the United Kingdom of Great Britain from, uh, from the Roman province of Britain. So also many other things, British, Encyclopedia Britannica, all these are derived from the Roman name, the British Isles, um, the Britons, all of those things are derivatives of uh, Roman Latin language for um, regions of the British Isles. <clears throat> so the Rom when the British start to consolidate their control over the British Isles and they start to colonize places around the world. Um, they call it the British Empire and this is because they recognized that Rome was an empire and they were colonized by Rome and Londinium was like a second Rome. It was created, although they don't call it the second Rome, they call it Istanbul, which is um, what used to be Constantinople, the second Rome. The third Rome, sometimes people refer to it as London or even Moscow and the fourth Rome could be uh, the United States. Uh, there's lots, we'll talk about Roman influence throughout this course because uh, 
that's where um, powerful Western states usually look back to in history to the point where the Roman Empire, that's the high watermark of Western culture until the Renaissance in Italy and France and, and the Western you know, European countries um, revive themselves culturally, um, militarily, and, and so on. So we'll, we'll talk about the relationship between the Romans and the British Empire again later um, and tomorrow. So Alfred, Alfred himself, he, he, as I said, these are Germanic peoples essentially. Uh, some people say that it wasn't so much a conquering as sort of a um, gradual sort of cultural dominance, right? Almost like the Romans were. There's not as many, uh, most of the, the people that uh, live in England now <clears throat> can trace their roots all the way back to the Celtic people, especially through the female line. There's been lots of genetic studies done now that um, sort of support the idea that there were battles and there there were there was an invasion but it wasn't a complete like um, slaughter of all of the the people and uh, replacements of those people by german people but that more like they conquered everybody and uh, the people that they they ruled over sort of integrated with them which makes sense because that's normally what happens um, in history even the really brutal invasions and conquerors like the Mongolians spread all over the place. They killed millions and millions of people, no doubt. Um, but they also intermarried and intermingled with people across Asia. And, um, you know, there's genetic evidence for that too, that there's 15 or 16 million Asian people that carry the so-called Genghis Khan gene, um, which they can trace back to a single ancestor um, in the 13th century, which that's why it's not, it's probably not Genghis Khan. It's probably another Mongolian, but it just means that the genetics uh, support the idea that there, there was uh, some blending of the people, not just a replacement of the culture. So Alfred was a part of this cultural dominance. The language changed for everyone. Um, people in Wales, people in Scotland, people in Ireland remained, uh, continued to speak Gaelic. Right? or Gaelic, I think is the per correct pronunciation. They continue to speak um, Gaelic for you know, centuries, for a thousand years going forward, up until you know, the, the um, British Empire sort of starts to develop in the 16th and 17th century. They're still speaking um, their own language, which is Celtic. Uh, the Irish have done the best at preserving um, their linguistic heritage. They, they have thousands, tens of thousands of people who still speak Irish, like native Irish, Gaelic Irish, not Irish English, um, despite the fact that there's been a, an attempt by the British to um, convert everybody to speaking English in the British Isles. Uh, there's still Scottish Gaelic, there's still Welsh Gaelic, and there's still Irish Gaelic. Um, a thousand years after um, Alfred the Great came uh, and his ancestors sort of you, they started to spread Old English. Old English is a lot more like Danish um, and Old German than it is like present day modern English, which is sort of a mixture of Latin and Greek and French and, and Germanic English. Canute the Great is a interesting person. He becomes because Alfred's line, the Anglo-Saxon line, doesn't produce effective leaders and they end up with um, nobody being able to become the king, they, they sort of by default need somebody outside the, the Anglo-Saxon um, ethnic group to become the king. And Canute is um, the king of Denmark and Norway and you know the Vikings have been expanding um, Norway sort of has, Nor there's lots of Norwegian influence in Ireland. Dublin is actually initially settled by Vikings. It's initially a Viking settlement. Northern part of England is, is under the Dane law, which is under the control of the Danes. Scotland, for the most part, is being controlled by the Vikings. So he has control of Norway, some of the Swedish people, Denmark, 
Scotland, Ireland, and England sort of asks him if he will become their king as well. And of course, he's happy to sort of create this North Sea Empire. Um, he's, a, he's a contemporary of some of the, the new emperors in the Holy Roman Empire and the powerful kings of France. And he goes to the continent and he's sort of treated as an equal because he has his own empire. Uh, the, the Holy Roman Empire is basically Germany and Austria. Um, it eventually spreads into Hungary as well. Um, but he's treated as sort of uh, an equal to them, which is pretty impressive because England, um, despite its status now, we think of the United Kingdom as an important country. It was sort of, um, during the Viking Age especially, uh, sort of backwater compared to what was going on uh, in on the continent. The Franks, uh, Charles the Great, Charlemagne, and the Holy Roman Empire that he created, um, the German states, they were all much wealthier, more people, and more power. But during Canute's reign, things are relatively good. Uh, they don't get invaded by the Vikings because they're ruled by the Vikings. They're all part of the same sort of empire and state. So uh, he provides protection for them. But when he dies, uh, he splits his lands amongst his children, and they're not the same caliber of person as him. Uh, so it falls apart right after his death. Uh, they find Edward the Confessor, who is a descendant of the Anglo-Saxon kings. He's been hiding in France, northern France, in Normandy for a while. He comes back. Um, he's, he's related to the Anglo-Saxon kings, so he becomes the king, but his rule is also unsuccessful. He doesn't have any children. Uh, he gets married, but he doesn't have any children by his queen. And he's very, very church-oriented. So some people accuse him of being, you know, not making an effort. Um, he doesn't seem to have gotten along very well with his queen, his wife. Uh, so they don't have any children. And he ends up being the last Anglo-Saxon. So the Anglo-Saxon kingdom sort of uh, achieves its height in a period of about 200 years. And then... Edward the Confessor dies in 1060, um, in 10, the early part of 1066. And then by the end of 1066, uh, the, the Anglo-Saxon king that replaces him, who's not related to Alfred, um, he will end up fighting a battle and then be defeated. And after that, uh, the, after that king, there's no direct... Um, descendants of any Anglo-Saxons that be become the king. So from 1066, I remember. I, I hope you remember me saying this. All of this is before 1066, and we can split sort of British history into these two parts: before 1066 and afterwards. And um, there's three kings that end up fighting over England in 1066, and the winner is William the Conqueror. And we'll talk about him next week after we do the quiz. Uh, the quiz is just going to be on chapter one material. So tomorrow um, I will talk about the people that these famous leaders, this is called ancient leaders, this, this uh, lecture. And uh, we'll talk about what, they, what those people were like and what their main characteristics were and how they contributed to the development of uh, British culture, okay? So thank you. I apologize for the, the late uh, upload, but uh, yes, we'll talk about that tomorrow. And uh, this, you can watch this lecture afterwards. That's not a problem. Next Wednesday, there's a quiz. Don't forget that. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day.